Okay, I'm going to do the walkabout microphone. Thank you very much for the invitation, um, and it's been a really interesting um, day already. Um, I'm also very much looking forward to working more intensively with some of you, I presume, out in the audience. Um, on the lighting workshop that we'll be doing over the, or social research and in lighting design workshop that we'll be doing um, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, as I think I got from the introduction, yes, I have to start with a confession. I am a sociologist. Okay? I'm not a designer. I'm not an architect. Um, sometimes I really wish I was. Um, it's a lot more fun. Um, I really love working with designers and architects, and that's really the main thing I've been doing over the last four or five years. Um, but I'm not, I'm a sociologist. Um, and what I really want to talk about um, is some of the problems um, and some of the possibilities, um, and some of what we mean by um, connecting social research, social analysis, social knowledge um, to different kinds of lighting design work. It's really clear that for some time, um, as lighting itself has kind of gotten a higher profile out in places like municipalities, architectures, practices, and so on over the last few years, um, it's become very easy to say, oh, we must look at the social aspects of lighting, um, that we must address the social, that somehow the social has to be part of what we do as lighting designers. Um, really one of the main things I want to talk about is it's really complicated, okay? That's not an easy thing to do. And a lot of us mean very different things, and again, speaking as a sociologist, a lot of people mean very, very different things by the very idea of the social, or doing social research, or having, in, involving social knowledge in their, in their design practices. And that's the kind of stories I want to talk about. What we mean by the social and what are the problems in actually using social knowledge and research within lighting design. Um, I'm a sociologist at the London School of Economics, as, um, as Alexandra said, and I've got a little research group that's been going for about four years called Configuring Light, Staging the Social. Um, and really, that research group does exactly what it says in the title, that's to say, it is interested in the way in which light as a material, as stuff, is configured, is formed, is given shape um, through a range of social practices, social expertise and skills, um, technologies and institutions. How do we make light as a stuff into um, the stage, literally, on which social life is performed? For a sociologist, that's really the, the thing that really interests me. Light is part of every interaction, every kind of social encounter. Everything happens in some degree of light and darkness. How is that aspect of social life staged? And how does it enter into the ways in which we relate to each other in actual social interaction? Um, so, uh, my PowerPoint transitions have not worked. I was going to reveal things slowly. Um, so what we're interested in here is light as material culture. I was interested to hear a number of speakers earlier um, talk about light as a building material, or something to be used, a material to use in construction. I totally agree, but I just wanted to clarify, when as a sociologist I'm thinking about light as a material, um, as I say, I work with designers, and I'm really interested in the ways in which they configure, or you configure light. Um, and I work with a lot of designers, literally looking over their shoulders sometimes at how they work with this stuff. Um, but light in the social world is configured in an awful lot of other ways. Every time, obviously, we drive down the street, our headlights are also configuring light and dark in that space. Every time I walk into the kitchen to cook something, I flick on a light. So the idea of light as material culture covers all of that, every way in which light enters into the way in which the social is staged. Um, having said that, as I said, we've, we've got a very strong and enduring commitment to working with designers um, and people who, as it were, professionally configure light um, and think about the different ways in which we can collaborate, 
the ways in which um, social research and social knowledges can enter into design practices, but also, frankly, vice versa. I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about how, working, how designerly ways of working change the ways in which I might do social research. And it's actually changed incredibly the way I actually go down and do, go out and do research. Um, purely opportunistically, because of who gives us money and access to do various things, we've largely focused on lighting in the urban public realm. We work on streets, parks, public spaces, and so on. Um, I would love to be doing other things as well, like houses, um, car headlights we've just been discussing, um, and so on. But a lot of our work is on the urban public realm. And a very strong focus of what we do um, is questions about um, urban inequality, urban diversity, and the kind of material basis of urban multiculturalism. How does light play into all the incredible range of differences um, that make up, again, the staging of, of social life? The image that you've got at the top there um, is one way of expressing um, a lot of our concern there. That's actually an image, ah, there it is, um, of, the, of Westminster in London. Um, incredibly, not just rich upmarket area, the lights that you see there are still gas lights lit by a guy who goes around every night. It's a heritage site, okay? And in terms of the material culture of light, you see a clear set of social values being staged, okay? Um, and enjoyed and experienced and so on, including things like not just the color, the little lovely kind of Victorian pools of light that you, want, you know, walk through, um, but also things like the relationship between inside and outside here, a kind of warm, cozy relationship that goes on. Um, that codes the city in very particular ways. We more normally work in um, this kind of place, which is the White Cross housing estate. Um, on the other side of London, in, um, near Old Street. That's actually, I've been trying to turn down the orange on that image, and I keep forgetting to use the right image. It's lit like a prison yard, okay? It's a social housing estate where the incredible luminosity, the just, it's all about brightness, visibility, surveillance, okay? Which codes it so clearly as a place where you are expecting trouble, where the main responsibility of authorities is not aesthetics and, and um, heritage, um, but keeping public order, okay? I could wax lyrical about that, but I think that gives you a sense of the kinds of dimensions that we're looking at and the ways in which different forms of social power, inequality, diversity, and so on are coded into the material fabric um, of our cities and the part that light plays in all that. I want to talk, firstly, I said um, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of the problems of actually dealing with those kinds of issues and what it means to bring the social into um, thinking about light in the city. Um, I want to just very briefly outline four of the main problems that we've encountered over the last four years of configuring light. The ones that are in our face every time we deal with the range of stakeholders that we deal with, not just designers, but municipalities, residents, police, a whole range of people. Um, one of the main ones, um, and it's interesting the way it's come up in previous um, talks today, is that very often when we deal with um, clients, research subjects, stakeholders, whoever we're working with, um, there's a sense that when you are talking about the relation between light and people, that one is talking about mainly behavioral issues and individual issues. It's where you find increasing numbers of headlines and adverts around the idea of, you know, well, blue light makes you more alert, okay? The problem with light at the moment is that it isn't, that light pollution disrupts circadian rhythms. Um, we also had, I mean, really related to the, the stuff about human-centric um, approaches to lighting. Um, as a sociologist, I don't do humans. I, don't know, I can't generalize about humans. I don't know who they are. Um, what I do know is lots of individual of, of types of people um, encounter, in particular social relations, encountering light in very complex social spaces. I don't know what the impact of blue light is on behavior. 
um, on alertness and so on. What I do know is that people in different kinds of um, places in different parts of the world, different people in different in individual places are um, encountering blue light and giving different meanings to blue light. Again, think about the color of light in Westminster versus White Cross. Um, Second issue that we've come across, again, you know, if you're thinking about um, light as purely, what's its impact on behavior? You kind of miss the social. Um, another huge issue that we come across, um, again, there have been lots of hints of this throughout the day, is that lighting tends to be split between, on the one hand, functional discourses, functional ways of talking about light. Light is about um, economy, cost, um, making everything visible on a street. This is a picture which we'll return to if I've got time a bit later on, of a little town in Derby, about the size of Timisoara, actually, um, in which those lights were put in for maximum surveillance, minimum cost, minimum maintenance, and so on. And it's clearly horrendous and hated by most people. Okay? Um, it actually flattens the entire street into a kind of atmosphere-less um, Place. It was done largely I mean, for many people in order to make it feel more safe, and they don't. They actually feel that this is, again, like a prison yard, and off to the side are deep, dark caverns of black where they feel really unsafe. The other side of lighting, um, this is from a publicity brochure from Marketing Derby, and it was amazing that um, most ways of kind of giving a place identity to Derby were night shots, night photography. It's all about it's what we call aesthetics, romanticism, okay? And again, between those two, neither of those particularly relate to what people are doing on the street, to social practices. Um, the social is kind of absent from both of these. The first one is all about the functional, the technical, the economic, the efficient, and so on. This one is all about the romantic, the aesthetic, and so on. As one person who saw this image a long time ago said, what we really want to know is, what is that woman doing on the bridge? Okay? What is she doing? How does she feel? How does the light affect her experience of the city, her ability to do the things that she wants to do in that city, go where she wants to go, be with the people she wants to be with, and so on? That's the bit that actually interests us okay? and keeps getting lost. Another issue, which I'll talk very briefly about, is um, for many people, social research tends to just mean consultations. That's to say, some sense of you know, putting a, a you know, kind of standing out there, getting a few residents to come and give their opinions of a design. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> um, getting their opinions of a design. Um, social research is not about consultations. It's about actively going out and finding who are the stakeholders, who are the what are the main divisions, issues, problems, and so on, and doing that in a relatively systematic way so that I, one can actually speak with some confidence about what is going on, rather than simply responding very reactively to what usually happens to the few people who turn up at the table where you're showing your design. A final problem that we come across constantly um, is the problem of connecting social and spatial um, analysis and design. Um, in working with designers over lighting. And just very quickly, one um, example, that, one story that um, in our research group we keep coming back to, Letcher and my first co um, collaboration was a workshop at, um, on the White Cross estate in London, um, which brought together 25 lighting designers, architects, planners, a whole range of people um, from 11 different countries to work on one housing estate White Cross Estate, um, and each group was asked to, was trained in various social research methods, and then s worked on particular um, specific sites to both learn those sites um, in, from a social point of view, and then to de develop design responses through light to them. The story is about Group Five, which is up here, and the simple story was, um, like most designers and architects and a lot of people. Um, although we actually set a social research task, go out and interview people, what they did is immediately s sit down with the plan, the map, and do a spatial analysis, okay? And a lot of that spatial analysis came down to uh, saying that this block of flats that they were dealing with, 
The problem with it is obvious. You can just see it from looking at the map. Um, that this is the front of those buildings. It faces out from the estate, so they're alienated from the life or excluded from the life of the rest of the estate. That front is broken up by, um, it was a horrible little car park, which was unusable for any kind of other social activities except getting your car and then and fleeing, et cetera, et cetera. The problem was, um, as they found out in the first hour of interviewing, okay, the problem was that as far as any resident they talked to, that was not the front of the building. Okay? That's the front of the building. And again, what, what, what came across very strongly to people was a sense of how do you move between spatial and social analysis here? Where does talking to people actually fit in? Now, this is not to say that those people were right or that it was the only way of dealing with this in design terms. But what it certainly meant was that this was part of the lived experience of that space, which any design would have to deal with and contend with and do something about. That's the actual back. And the design that they eventually came up with um, did actually say, OK, if people want that to be the front of the building, that's the front of the building. Um, we're going to emphasize through light um, that that is the way that building is used, practiced, understood, and so on. Um, and deal with other issues that followed on from the fact that um, this was the unrecognized front of the building. There was a walkway that went through the estate um, used by a lot of people who didn't live on the estate. And one of the things the design was to, meant to say was, we're actually a very hospitable estate. We like people to come and, and walk through here. But just remember, you're visiting the front of our house. Okay? And the lighting was meant to actually say that. Again, the issue here is about how to um, put together um, social and spatial design. One of the things that we make a very strong point about is that the role of social research here is not to say to designers, you are wrong or you are right, or to say um, this is how you should do things, but this is a dialogue about the relation between spatial readings and social readings and how to put them together. In what time I've got left, um, I want to just go through two more stories, short stories, which say, which say something about different kinds of difficulties in um, dealing with the social in lighting design um, and raise different kinds of complexities um, that we've been dealing with. This was a study, one of the first large-scale research projects that we did called Darby After Dark, and that was that image I showed you at the beginning. Um, in which we were um, working in a small again, a population, about 250,000 um, city in the Midlands of the UK. And basically the story goes something like this. Um, Spears and Major, with whom we've been working for some time, have been employed by Derby City Council um, to do a lighting master plan for them. Um, Spears and Major were interested in working with social researchers in a quite intensive way to see how some of these issues of knowing the city could be addressed and translated into lighting terms. But the situation was, was rather more complex than that. And one of the stories, one of the parts of the stories that's really important is that in the end, our role there as social researchers was not simply to carry out certain kinds of interviews and observations and measurement of footfall and so on, which told them something about how people use the city. We did that, and that was really important. Um, but equally important was the role of light in the broader politics and power within the city, why people were concerned about light. And again, I would go back to this kind of picture. Um, the reason that those lights were put in, as I gave, is that um, in the end, was that um, the lighting for Derby was handed over to one large structural engineering company, Balfour Beatty, under what is simply a neoliberal finance arrangement in which they put in the cheapest possible light in the most functional possible way as quickly as possible so they could sit back and collect rent, basically, from Derby for the next 25 years. Okay? The people who had hired Spears and Major were a new regeneration t a team called Regeneration Team, who were looking at how to reconstitute Derby, how to rethink it. There was place branding, but there was also economic development. There was digital regeneration. There was a whole range of things pulled together to say, how do we redefine Derby? This was deeply symbolic. And for Derby City Council, two things were going on here. 
which were major social issues. One was lighting is actually important. The street doesn't work, and it doesn't work the way it ought to in relation to the kinds of identities and practices that they wanted to encourage in Derby that made up their plan. Um, but it was also um, a way of saying, using light and looking at this kind of space, was a way of saying to a whole range of stakeholders, the mayor, the council leader, and so on and so forth, different departments in the city council, a way of saying, you can transform your city. Okay? We use the phrase lighting as leverage, that there were ways of that lighting here was a kind of test case for political control, political power, social transformation, participation of various kinds of stakeholders, and so on and so forth. So the idea of the social here was not just how do people use the street and how does lighting play into that, but what role did lighting play in the entire idea of Derby um, and civic governance there? One simple thing there was that in doing any interviews with people about light and how they use the city. Obviously, we have conversations about, you know, where are you trying to go? How do you go there? What paths should be lit? All the kind of Kevin Lynch stuff, you know, about how to um, make the, the kind of uses of the city visible to people, legible. Um, but they immediately became conversations about what is Derby? What kind of place is it? What kind of place should it be? How do we reflect that in both material and political terms? So the idea of lighting here um, as social intervention and our role as social researchers became increasingly complex. And frankly, we spent as much time interviewing council people um, to get a political story as we'd spent, sp not as much, but quite a lot of time, um, interviewing um, different kinds of users of the city. Just to say, the, the form of um, research, um, this was one of the most conventional pieces of sociology I've done in quite a long time, actually. Um, we went out and interviewed people um, who were um, the kinds of stakeholders that the council was interested in. Um, the question that tended to be f um, formulated was, what's your ideal night out, or what's a typical night out? How do you use the city at night? Um, and doing interviews with a whole range of people some of the um, important stuff, just to give a sense of how the politics and the kind of street level questions like that played together, was in many ways some of the, the most powerful or some of the most effective interventions that both we, the, the regeneration team and Spears and Major were able to make was to say, which are the stakeholders that you don't really understand and don't understand their relationship to light and the importance of light? Um, in the way they use the city. Just two very quick examples. Um, it's almost unbelievable to think back now, but on the list of stakeholders we were asked by the council to um, do research on, um, older people were not on the list. You know, 65 plus, and yet these are the people who are most disproportionately affected by any shift in lighting. You move the light um, a few meters in either direction from a bus stop or the route that an older person might take from the bus stop to the city center, and all of a sudden, they're not coming to the city. They're not, you know, they, they do not have a right to the city at that point. So that was one kind of thing. So just talking to older people, finding the kinds of um, uses of the city which they felt either included or excluded from was crucial. Another one, just very quickly, was youth. The council loved to talk about youth, young people, how young people use the city. And particularly young people, that's a real problem, aren't they? You know, they're always getting drunk and kind of, you know, getting disorderly. And, um, you know, they're just basically a public safety issue. Um, one of the just obvious things that came out of bog standard social research was to find out that there was no such thing as youth. Uh, certainly one of the main things was there were two kinds of youth. There were local youth, basically working class youth, who used the city in one way and used different bits of the city. And then there were, um, I mean, about 15% of the population of Derby were university students. They never talked to each other. They didn't use the same spaces. Um, and interestingly, the university students were stuck in, in dormitories on the edge outskirts of Derby um, and actually were afraid to come into Derby, partly because of stories about the other youth and partly because the path that led into the city um, were simply dark. Really simple stuff. This is a different kind of story, um, but again, it talks about 
the complexities of collaboration, um, and it says something about the way in which social researchers and designers might start challenging and redefining each other's roles and what they should be up to. Um, this was a, um, a study, I shouldn't use the past tense, we're hoping to get the money to keep it in the present tense and go on to the next stage. Um, it was a, uh, it's a lighting design initiative in Cartagena in Colombia, on the Caribbean coast, um, and it's a collaboration with um, Arab, uh, Arab's lighting urban lighting design group, um, Lenny Schwendiger, um, who was developing or has been for a long time developing the idea of nighttime design. The idea of thinking about the nighttime as a, a, a social space with its own kind of conditions, which des deserves, in a sense, its own kind of design principles. We don't entirely agree about that, but that was good to, to kind of work with. The specific brief here um, was to develop um, what you call small, repeatable um, lighting interventions. In the end, we ended up with a, uh, a small lantern, um, which involved community participation, both in design, but also in customizing and placing the lights. These are lights which will be put on, um, most of them, on um, doorways um, of private and commercial residences, and with a strong commitment to develop social, social and spatial research methodologies and get those kinds of conversations going between them. The area we're working in, Hetzamani, um, it's in Cartagena, but it's not Cartagena um, as a lot of people associate with the place. Um, Cartagena as a whole is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the, one of the best preserved um, colonial, imperial, whatever, um, cities in Latin America. Um, most of it has been intensively renovated in relation to things like the tourism and heritage um, industry. Um, Hetsemani, on the other hand, has long been the very marginalized working class um, area, unruly, you know, kind of dissolute seamen and ex-slaves kind of place. However, um, it's rapidly gentrifying. Um, the, as we're indigenous population, is reduced to almost about 15% at this point. Um, and that kind of scene, this is the main social square in Etsy, Plaza Trinidad, um, is a mixture of remaining local residents, um, backpackers, different kinds of um, tourists, um, middle class um, Cartagenans from other bits of Cartagena who come there for the clubbing and, and nightlife and so on and so forth. What everyone really loves about it is the atmosphere the kind of multicultural atmosphere, the edginess of all those people coming together, which I always, I feel, and we all agree, was reflected in the kind of berserk, messy lighting, which is not just a failure of infrastructure, but is actually the production of a certain kind of atmosphere, whichever we want. I had eight-year-old boys um, who I interviewed saying, please don't change the lighting because we love the warm glow. It feels like fire, okay? That kind of thing. Um, to be contrasted with the, what they call the other Cartagena. Um, the other districts which have been muse museumized and are usually referred to by Hetsamani residents as the, uh, you know, not just the other city, but the ghost town. It's a ghost town. It's a ghost town in two senses. One, it's incredibly dark because it has been so gentrified. So many of the homes have been bought. They're all second homes and the lights are always out. The place goes dead. Um, but also because of the kind of museumized, neat and tidy look. And I think what a lot of people were concerned about was this kind of contrast between, again, the vibrancy of the square there um, and the kind of, this was just around the corner from that, a kind of international style of bland um, design, lighting design, which actually killed everything. And frankly, that street was dead. No one walked out despite all the light, despite the fact that it f kind of followed all the rules of lighting, okay? No one, it was of no interest to anyone. Um, again, what I want to say is that this is about a challenge to understand what's going on here, how people are using that space. It's not simply asking people a few questions. It's how do you read this space? How do the people there read the space? What are they doing with it? 
To give Lenny a total respect, um, when she first walked into the space, I'd already been doing about 10 days of, of research with a Colombian anthropologist. Um, she walked into the space and the first thing she said was, I probably shouldn't do anything, I could only fuck it up. Okay? We moved on from that position, okay? <laughs> that there were ways of, you know, and I, I think that's the kind of social and design problem that we were dealing with here. How do you, to use the phrase from the earlier, how do you sensibly, rationally, intelligently, and knowledgeably move on from that sense of, here is a social ecology we're about to intervene in by putting in lights. How can we do this in a responsible way? What, what do we need to know? How do we deal with it? And again, the idea here was not, oh, as sociologists or as anthropologists, we were going to provide all the answers and tell the designers what to do. It was, what kind of dialogue can we build up here in order for all of us to behave responsibly and to fit into the kind of local love of that atmosphere and not kill it? And that's basically what we've been working on. The other thing I just want to say very quickly, Lenny started by calling this her um, Doors and Street Corners project. That's to say, um, she was concerned about these small repeatable design interventions to be things which enhance so sociability in a space, to encourage more pleasurable interactions between people and so on. And coming from New York, she thought about doors, you know, this is about hospitality and so on, and street corners, where do you meet up, where paths kind of cross and so on. Again, in this case, after about an hour in Hetzemany, we realized there were no street corners probably because there were no pavements, okay? It didn't work like that. Pedestrian movement didn't work like that. But there also really were no doors, where doors didn't play any significant part in life. Um, what did were these kind of permeable borders between public and private, which played a part both in how sociability actually was carried out. Um, that's to say, you know, you might be sitting like this guy um, in your living room, with various kinds of rule governed interactions with people passing by on the street, or you might be sitting outside um, using those kinds of grills as something that provides light. Again, the task here, um, which again involved complex conversations with the designers, was to say, how do these things work? And at the most micro level, as a social sociologist, anthropologist, um, what does this say about the relation between private light and public light? And how does that mediate relations between private homes and the state as a provider of infrastructure? We had people talking about, you know, who pays for the light on the street in such a way that I can use it to sit on my doorstep, okay? And it was all about, am I a citizen? What should the state be providing for me? And so on and so forth. So again, very large questions come out of these very micro encounters. and led to a, an analysis which, again, was one of the points of interaction of meeting space between the designers and the researchers, social researchers, which was to say, can we talk about the ways in which different distributions of light here, including those grills, um, structures, the way in which people gather, we use the phrase social hotspots. And so the design might need to knowledgeably engage with those hotspots, the ways in which the material structures of the street, like light, um, and social gathering work together. Anyway, very briefly, I'll round up. Um, in the year between our first research, where we did that kind of stuff, you know, in obsessive concern with grills um, and doorways, um, in the year after that, um, the Arab group put together a design response, and it was basically a lantern, um, which was produced by Iguzzini, um, and we brought it back to Hetsamani for a pilot installation, and to kind of use that as a basis for a different kind of social research. And very briefly, what we um, actually did, whereas the first kind of um, social research, the first um, visit to Hetsamani, was all about, I talking to all the stakeholders, finding their use of places like Trinidad and so on and so forth. This is all about light. It's the first time I've, as a social researcher, really just spent time walking around with my Microsoft Surface book and some images of the street that we were going to do a pilot installation on and talk to about 20 people, a couple of hours each, 
saying, just keep looking at that photograph and tell me where the light is coming from, how it might play into your experience of that street, how it relates to other streets you know, and so on and so forth. And just going through endless questions, absolutely focused on the light. Um, we also did uh, workshops in which um, the lanterns were customized by people. And again, this was partly community participation and involvement. It was also an incredibly um, productive research experience. What do these lights mean to them? What did the idea of a lantern mean to them? It produced incredible kinds of thoughts about Caribbean culture, about the identity of Hetzemani, about what they wanted to tell visitors about this space, and so on, all mediated through the material culture of light and a lantern. So that was an amazing research experience itself. Um, and then an installation, and I just to stop the end there with a fairly to me, this is one of the most um, optimistic and happy photos um, from my experience of configuring light. I'm not expecting you to feel quite the same warm glow, um, but it, I, I absolutely love it. Um, because what it was, was after 18 months of working on this project and coming back to Hetsemane for another round of research, doing those workshops, putting the lights up, it's not just that everyone on the street loved them. That was gratifying, that's really nice. We had a very festive evening where people just took over the street, it was wonderful. People gave me lots of drinks, that was fun too. Um, it was that you could actually see the ways in which that light was nothing I could have predicted from my social research engagements. I never told anyone to do this. Um, but I could see how it absolutely related to the kind of social research issues that were raised. It's about preserving an atmosphere. It's about human level lighting in the sense of something which is related to people's practice, which relates the light to what they're trying to do on the street. It doesn't get rid of the vernacular and the kind of, uh, you know, other kinds of lights. I love the, that light with the guy, the, 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 the grilled food thing. Um, and it is about not just conviviality or good design, but the conviviality that is specific to Hetzemani and that we learned about through all that kind of research. Anyway, thanks very much.